So uh, my lesson tonight, the glory of singing in worship. This is lesson uh, number four in the series uh, In Spirit and Truth, the glory of singing in worship. Uh, I want to show you a picture here. There it is. For many years before we bought a new building, the church in Montreal, this is a picture of the church in Montreal, many of you have been there to see this. The church in Montreal was located right next door to a Pentecostal church. So on your left you see the entrance with the red door, that was the, at the time the Verdun Church of Christ. And then you see the other door you know, to the right there with the column that goes up, there was another entrance, that was the Verdun Pentecostal church. And this whole unit here used to be, you know, many, many years ago, the Verdun Presbyterian Church. And so we bought the back half of it back, you know, I think in 1985 or something like that. And uh, the, the, that other side, the right hand side there was empty for many, many years and then this Pentecostal group bought it. Now the reason I mention this and I show this picture here is that they had their service at about the same time we had our service on Sunday uh, morning and we could hear their band <laughs> playing. Piano, guitar, drums, bass, sometimes horns, whatever. We could hear the band, especially the bass and the drums, through the walls. And so it made us sing louder. <laughs> what was strange is that at times they would happen to pick a song that, that we were singing and it was, it was like they were, you know, anyways, we won't go there. Now their minister, I knew him, his name was Billy English. He was a nice guy and we used to, you know, we used to visit from time to time because we'd see each other you know, on Sundays and that. He even came to the inaugural service for our new building when we moved it to another part of the city and we invited him and he was very gracious and he, he came to that. Now there are a lot of differences between our respective churches, teachings. They had no Bible class, just one long service. They believed in miraculous gifts, speaking in tongues and prophecy in the modern age. And of course, we, we didn't believe that the Bible taught that. They used all kinds of musical instruments and performers in their public worship. But when Billy and I got together and we talked about church matters, the only thing that piqued his curiosity about us was why we only sang at our worship service. That's the only question he ever had. He understood the rest of it. He understood why we had Bible classes and why we didn't believe in modern miracles. He understood that, but he didn't get why we didn't use instruments. He said that this was the most distinct feature about our group and it really separated us from the others. He told me, you're, 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 you, know, you are different in this way than any, I've never met any other church group that does what you do as far as music is concerned in the public assembly. So it seems a shame that so many in our brotherhood, I say all of this to say, it seems a shame that so many in our brotherhood are toying with the idea of adding instruments to worship and in doing so removing one of the most unique features of our identity. Of course, as curious as Billy was, he never really gave me a chance to clearly explain why we only use uh, singing in our praise and adoration of God in public worship. So it seems to me that uh, there are a lot of people out there, even in the church, who are not quite sure why we have this practice in the churches of Christ. And so for this reason, and with the hope that maybe Billy one day will stumble across this uh, video online, let me simply give you the three basic reasons why the Church of Christ does not use instruments in public worship. Reason number one, there is no command in the New Testament to do so. One of the most important elements of faith in God is worship. The very first commandment in the Old Testament is the prohibition against worshiping any other God but the Lord. In the Old Testament, God was very specific about how He wanted the Jews to worship Him. The building of the tabernacle, for example, in the desert, as well as the temple in Jerusalem, was all done according to God's detailed instructions. Uh, there are at least five chapters 
uh, of instructions in the book of Exodus telling the Jews how God wanted the tabernacle. Five chapters devoted to exactly how this, you know, this, tab, this tent was to be built in the desert. The manner in which the Jews worship, the manner in which they offered the sacrifice, the dressing of the priests, all explained down to the smallest detail. Even the musical instruments to be used, who and when to play them, were laid out by God to Moses and David and the prophets. For example, in Numbers, let me get there, Numbers chapter 10, verse one and two, let me read that, it says, the Lord spoke further to Moses saying, make yourself two trumpets of silver, of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camps set out. So God here, they're using a musical instrument for a certain purpose, but God specifies which instrument and, and how it's supposed to be made and when it's supposed to be used. Another passage in chapter 10, verse eight, it says, the priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your uh, generation. So here he specifies who is going, not anybody can play the trumpets. He specifies who can play these trumpets. And then in Numbers 10, 10, it says also in the day of your gladness and in your appointment feasts, and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. He even explains when to blow them and why to blow them. So to say that God doesn't care, you know, just do what you want, is, is not really understanding what the Bible teaches concerning music. God does care about music in worship, if we look here in the Old Testament. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25, it says, He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offering on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord also began with the trumpets, accompanied by the instruments of King David. The reason that I read this is the following. God, through the prophets Gad and Nathan, gave instructions to David at first as to which instruments and how they were to be used in temple worship. David did not invent this. You know, a lot of people say, well, David invented the use of instruments. No, David didn't invent the use of instruments. David didn't introduce the use of instruments in, in, the, in, the, in the temple worship. God gave to the prophets the information and the prophets told David what he was to do concerning this matter. The Jews never added or changed around these commands. So you're wondering, what's this passage in 2 Chronicles? Well, in this passage, the writers describe Hezekiah's restoration of temple worship after a long period of neglect. And note that when it came to music, what did he do? He reinstated what had been originally commanded before by God. Nothing more, nothing different, nothing less. My point here is that in the Old Testament, God was very specific in His instructions concerning the type of music used in the temple. Probably because the Jews were easily drawn into pagan worship and if left to themselves, <laughs> would you know, wander all over the place. Now the same idea carries over into the New Testament. God, through the apostles, still gives us the information we need about our worship to Him. I mean, aside from the Lord's Supper and prayer and teaching and preaching of God's word and caring for the church, the only instruction and command that we have about music in public worship is to sing. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, it says, 
what is the, Paul says, what is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Note Paul here is giving instructions about proper conduct in public worship of the church because the Corinthians were having some problems in this area. Another passage of scripture, Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19. It says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what is being filled with the Spirit? What does that consist of? Well, Paul continues by explaining, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Here, not only does Paul repeat the idea that singing is the proper and acceptable manner of musical praise to God, the word he uses means to sing without an instrument. Now in English, we use the term a cappella. If you're going to a concert, let's say, and you're saying, yeah, this is, there's an a cappella group playing at the theater, or you know, there's an a cappella concert. That means that this group of musicians will be singing without instruments. The term a cappella is an Italian term meaning chapel style. When we want to refer to singing without an instrument, we, we say, well, that's a cappella style. In the Greek language, the language of the New Testament, the word for singing without instruments is the word solo, which is exactly the word that Paul uses here. Another Example of this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul writes, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thank, uh, thankfulness in your hearts to God. Again, to a third group of churches, Paul repeats the exact same inspired instruction in reference to musical praise, using the word solo, meaning to sing only. So whenever Paul is talking about offering a, a praise in music or song praise to God, he always uses this term, to sing without an instrument. Now, what makes us think that the God who gave very specific commands to His people in the Old Testament about worship would let His people in the New Testament do whatever they wanted when it came to praise and music. <laughs> do we have like a different God operating here? Here's a God that gives these people you know, chapter after chapter of instruction on how to do everything, everything. Do you think that in the New Testament he says, you know what, I don't care anymore, I just do whatever you want. You want drama, fine. You want a parade, great. You want bands, terrific. You want to jump up and down and down, well, whatever. As long as you're sincere. Is that what it says? Can we find anywhere in the Bible where God specifies the rightness of something by saying, as long as you're sincere? If we ask the question, what command from God do we have as far as musical praise and worship is concerned? The answer from the New Testament is very clear. Sing, sing, only sing. Another reason why we do not use instruments of music in our public worship. There is no example. You know, what is interesting about the Old Testament and the use of instruments in praise is that there are many examples of their use. I mean, the Old Testament clearly describes in detail the use of instruments and choirs and parades. You know, to, to, to use the argument, well, you know, they were wrong when they did that and God corrected that in the New Testament. You know, it's to argue for the right purpose, but it's to use the wrong argument. God knew exactly what they were doing when they were doing that. He gave them the commands to do that. He gave them the instructions to do it. So there's no attempt to downplay the use of instruments in the Old Testament. It's not a gray area. They were commanded, they were used. We confirmed their use by God's command and the many examples of people obeying God's command by using them. Now, this same pattern is seen in the New Testament as well. God, 
through the apostle, commands the practice of singing without instruments in public worship. We see examples of this throughout the New Testament. You know, the point about instruments is made by the fact that you know, there isn't a single example of them being used or spoken of or referred to or debated over in all the New Testament today. Today we debate about this. Today, the, I mean, I've seen public debates. I've actually gone and filmed public debates over the use of instruments. Today we debate about that, but there was never any debate about this in the first century. They, 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 didn't, they didn't debate it because it was, it was clear to them. A question, why are there no examples of the use of instruments of music in, in the New Testament? Well, the easy answer is, well, they weren't used, that's why. <laughs> why can't you find them? Well, because they weren't there. And then the next question is, well, why weren't they there? Well, because the command was to sing. Have you, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why the Greek Orthodox Church, you know, the Greek Orthodox Church, have you ever wondered why they don't use instruments in their worship? Greek Orthodox, <laughs> Greek Orthodox, they're Greek. They understand the Greek language. When they read the New Testament in the Greek, they understand what it says. And they follow through to this day. So just as the Jews obeyed God's command to use instruments in certain ways in the Old Testament, Christians in the New Testament obeyed God's command to only sing. And the fact that there are no mentions of instruments in the New Testament shows that the early Christians were faithful in this regard. Third reason, the proof of history. Now one of the major arguments used by folks who use instruments in worship is that, well, the early church didn't use instruments because they worshiped underground and they were in hiding because of the Roman persecution. They had to be quiet. A Couple of problems with this argument. First of all, Christian worship is largely based on the Jewish synagogue worship, which did not use instruments either. And the persecution of Christians by Rome began some 30 years after the church was established. In 60, you know, the persecution started later on in the first century. But the church didn't use instruments during this time. Long after the Roman persecution and even Rome itself fell, the Christian church did not use instruments in worship. Historians, historians not theologians, Historians estimate that for at least the first thousand years of church history, the worship of the church was without instruments. A thousand years. Church historians, leaders, theologians, as far back as Justin Martyr, who was a leader in the church around 150 AD and defended Christianity in face of Roman persecution while led to his execution, this man, Justin Martyr, said and wrote, the use of singing with instrumental music was not received in the Christian churches as it was among the Jews. Uh, even Augustine, the Catholic monk in the fourth century, saw the use of instruments in worship as fleshly, that's how he described it. And it's interesting to note that Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas wrote in 1260 AD, the church does not use musical instruments when praising God, for musical instruments usually move the soul more to pleasure than create inner moral goodness. Of course, they're not arguing from the scripture here, but we get a glimpse into history as to what was taking place as far as this phenomenon is concerned. Even early Protestant reformers were against the use of instruments in public worship. In 1571, the French Protestant church formed under the influence of John Calvin or Jean Calvin, he was French, had 2,100, think about it, 2,100 congregations, some of which numbered over 10,000 members and all used a cappella music in their public worship. This business of using instruments and drama and all this kind of stuff in public worship is a very recent thing. Of course, this historical stuff, it's not biblical proof, but it's historical proof. It supports the Bible. 
Now I mentioned it to underscore the idea that the use of instruments and drama and orchestras and choirs and bands and praise teams, all of these things are relatively recent innovations that depart from what was practiced by the church for centuries. And so we use a cappella music because we believe the Bible instructs us to do so by command and example, but we also have the bulk of church history to confirm that this was the correct way to worship for centuries. And isn't this what we're about as a New Testament church? We want to be the church that God describes in the New Testament. Of course, not just in the way we worship, but in the way we preach the gospel and conduct our lives and we love one another and the way we prepare for the return of Jesus, of course. Worship is only one element, but it's an important one if we are truly to restore the practice of biblical Christianity in our generation. Okay, one other thing about music I'd like to share, and that is how just singing is a glorious act in worship. You know, we place a lot of importance on how we sing as opposed to the fact that we only sing in worship. Of course, we want to do our best and offer God songs that sound sweet and pleasant, but the fact that we only sing you know, without instruments, according to His command, has greater significance in the spiritual context of worship. John Price, in his great book, Old Light on New Worship. Let me give you a little background. John Price is not a, quote, Church of Christ author. I believe he's an evangelical, he's a Baptist. And he, in his study, decided to begin studying this, this business of you know, music in public worship. And very much like the, the author who, you know, uh, who, who tried to debunk you know, the idea of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus, and the more he studied it, found out that it was true, well, in the same way John Price, in his study and his research of history and you know, carefully examining all the passages of scripture, came to the conclusion, well, that we have come to for you know, several centuries now in the churches of Christ, that public worship, according to the Bible, is, uh, is to be a cappella style. And, and, and he is one who is kind of admonishing his evangelical you know, people that they should do away with instruments and, and go back to the Bible and the practice of the Bible. So he has a, an unusual point of view. Anyways, John Price in his book, Old Light on New Worship, lists several ways which Christ has lifted up the practice of singing in worship as a glorious thing. Jesus has made singing in worship glorious, first of all, by His own example. Jesus anoints singing as a glorious manner to praise God because He Himself sang praises with His apostles in the upper room on the night before He died. In Matthew 26, 30, Matthew says that they sang a hymn as was the custom of the Jews at Passover. The traditional hymn was the Hallel, which comprised of Psalms 113 to 118, either all of those Psalms or several of those Psalms. Hallel, Hebrew word for praise. Before His suffering and death, Jesus sang songs of praise and trust and thanksgiving. It is only fitting that when we worship, we follow the example of our Lord who exalts this practice by doing it Himself. Don't you want to worship in the way that Jesus Himself worshiped? Isn't that the key argument for all of this? Secondly, he glorifies this form of praise by making it a teaching ministry. I return to Colossians 3.16, where Paul says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When our singing is based on the word of God with songs taken directly from the Psalms or derived from the scripture, we're literally teaching and encouraging one another through songs. We don't get the feel for that as much in our modern you know, buildings because they're laid out in this way and sometimes they're maybe circular, but we know in the synagogues they faced each other, the rows like the rows were this way. You know? 
and this way, and they faced each other. So getting the idea of singing to one another, it was a little easier to kind of grasp that concept because you were literally singing to one another across the aisle. We, we kind of lose that here because we're kind of one, on, you know, one in front of, a, of another. When we sing, up from the grave he arose, are we not proclaiming the gospel to one another and any unbeliever who might be present? Aside from offering our love and praise to God, Congregational singing serves as a teaching ministry for the building up of the church. No instrument, no matter how beautifully played or numerous, can bless the church like the human voice declaring the truths of God in a spiritual song. It doesn't matter if you have a, a, a croaking voice or you're off key or you can't sing very loud, Whatever comes out of your heart through your mouth in spiritual song is more beautiful than a thousand harps or a thousand pianos. Why? Because it comes from the human heart. That's why. As I said before, some put way too much emphasis on the musicality of our singing, judging it by its tone or its pleasure to the ear. But God lifts up singing as an exalted method of praise because it is the direct link to a person's heart and faith. With the heart we believe, and with the mouth we proclaim in song that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, this is primal Christianity. It doesn't get more basic than that. And then finally, Jesus glorifies singing by making it a foretaste of heaven. John, in his vision of heaven, in the book of Revelation says, and they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, Revelation 15, three. Our singing here on earth in the church is the beginning and a hint of the experience of heaven. We only know vaguely what heaven will be like in negative terms, like we know, well, there's no death there, there's no sin there, there's no suffering there. You know, it's hard to imagine because we have all these things here on earth and we've always had them. So to experience the complete absence of these things is difficult for us. How difficult is it to to understand what it is like to have no sin. Well, it's hard because there's always been sin. You see what I'm saying? There's always been death. It's hard for us to imagine no sin, no death. But singing, and singing joyfully with faith, this is something we do know, something we actually do. God has given us this experience, among others, to help us actually feel in a very real sense what heaven will be like. As a matter of fact, John Price says in his book that singing is the only ordinance of the church that shall continue in heaven. When we see him face to face, preaching, prayer, communion, baptism, they shall all be done away with. The only thing left that we do here that we will continue to do there is to sing and to rejoice. All of these were means to call and unite people to Christ build their faith, and to remember His sacrifice. In heaven, none of these things will be necessary except to celebrate our everlasting relationship in a perfect spiritual union. And God has chosen singing as the way to do this in both heaven and here on earth. So, when we gather to worship, and when we gather to worship in song, Let's remember, shall we, that what we do is ordained by God and pleasing to Him because of our obedience, not our ob ability. God is pleased because we obey Him in this thing, not because we, can, you know, we, have, we have perfect pitch, or we have a lovely you know, alto voice or soprano voice. That's wonderful, that's a gift from God. But the thing that pleases Him is our obedience in this matter. Secondly, that a cappella singing is a glorious thing because Jesus has raised it above any other form of worship by His own example and also the teaching of the apostles. And then finally, 
that when we are two or more who gather in His name to worship God, Jesus is not only with us, but also sings with us as well. In Romans chapter 15, verse nine, Paul quotes several verses from Psalms showing that Christ himself was speaking through David concerning the eventual salvation of the Gentiles. In Psalm 1849, Christ declares through David his prophet the following. He says, therefore I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. So stand and sing knowing that you sing to God and with God when you lift your voices in song. So tonight, as we sing our invitation song, let's sing it with hearts calling out to those who need forgiveness or spiritual help to come forward and calling out to God to bless and to encourage the people who sing in order to worship Him and to please Him and to honor Him. And so if you are subject to the invitation tonight, please respond to the, uh, the calling that we make in song as we stand and as we sing the uh, song of encouragement that Harold has chosen for us tonight. Shall we stand?